to the DNVR Rockies podcast brought to you by DraftKings Sportsbook. Now new customers, when you sign up using promo code DNVR, you can place a $5 bet on any NBA pregame money line bet. And you win and you get $150 in bonus bets instantly. It's really that simple when you use code DNVR and DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NBA. I am your host, Patrick Lyons, and joining me today, a very special guest, uh, Mr. WBC, I think, uh, needs to be your name. All You're all about international baseball, crushing it on the uh, WBC Central over there on the Baseball Isn't Boring podcast. It's Sean Spradling. How's it going, Sean? Thanks, man. Yeah, it's going well. I've had a couple people say that it should be the WBC guy or Mr. WBC. Haven't come up with an actual name, but as long as people are watching the WBC and following my content, I'm happy with it. So you can call me whatever you want. <laughs> yeah, we'll talk plenty more about the 2023 World Baseball Classic, what's coming up in 2026, international baseball in general. But of course, let's uh, let's open with some some positive news from the Colorado Rockies, the six and seventeen Colorado Rockies, who have promoted one of their top outfield prospects today in Brenton Doyle, gets the uh, the call up uh, over a thousand OPS through twelve games with AAA Albuquerque this year, five tool player who has twenty twenty capabilities, twenty homers, twenty stolen bases. He's done that uh, the last two years in the minors. Pretty close to that. Has some strikeout in him, unfortunately, and uh, can go out and get the ball uh, because he is a minor league Gold Glove Award winner. He won that in 2021 in center field, no less. He was a fourth-round pick in 2019 out of Shepherd University in West Virginia, a Division II school, first Division II player selected in that draft. Uh, that's always a good story for a guy coming out of division two, but just in general for a player to make his major league debut, I think no matter what team you're pulling for or what sport you're following, the first game, a guy gets the opportunity to play is, is always fun and exciting. Yeah, that that's super exciting for him. Um, I mean, it's just like you said, I love this time of the year at the beginning of the season, because we do get to see a lot of call-ups guys that haven't, haven't had their chance yet, or, uh, may have impressed in the first couple of weeks of, of the minors that got to, uh, to actually get an opportunity to, to show out in the bigs is really exciting. Yeah, the the transaction was strange. We had uh, Jonathan Daza get hit in the hand on Sunday's game. Chris Bryant got lifted for uh, an injury related to his lower spine, but we're not going to say that it's a back injury uh, just yet. Yet those two guys <laughs> stay on the roster. El Hiris Montero, the third baseman, does get uh, demoted, if you will, sent back down to AAA and – uh, that's that's where the worry comes in for for Rockies fans because we've seen a lot of these young guys come up to the big leagues but not get an opportunity to play. Hopefully that's not the case here mm -hmm. for Brenton Doyle. We're number nine, and the number nine for Rockies, uh, has, there's been a lot of really solid players. So like the number five has been Matt Holiday and Carlos Gonzalez, and you go, shoot, you can retire the number five twice for those guys really if you're a Rockies fan. Number nine, there's one guy who probably should have his number nine retired, but still. Let me know if you've got anything on any of these guys, Sean, because they've they're all kind of fan favorites and very beloved, uh, and had had solid careers with the Rockies. Vinny Castilla, the first and probably the best. Juan Pierre, Ian Stewart, DJ Lemayhew, Daniel Murphy, Connor Joe, and now Brenton Doyle. I mean, that's got to be. I mean, that's an underrated number, like number nine for the Rockies. Like that whole list is pretty solid. I feel like. And it's funny that we talked to that that you mentioned Vinny Castilla as well. Obviously, Rockies legend. He also was on the coaching staff for Mexico in the 2023 WBC. So um, we can talk about this as well later on if you'd like. But uh, when I was in Miami watching the games and, and in Phoenix for this WBC, got to uh, just really briefly say hi to him. He had a lot of people surrounding him. But it was really cool to just see him in person after watching him in the baseball world for so long and learning about him with Team Mexico is really cool. So he's a really good guy, it seems like. And he looks like he can still play, right? Like he's he's better built now than than back then. Like it's it's amazing. We saw Griffey taking some cuts in the uh, in batting practice before the game for Team USA. I wouldn't have been surprised if if Vinny walked up there as well. Yeah, sometimes he will take batting practice at, at Coors Field, and he'll put balls out. They had a day last year where some of the middle schools and high schools will come to Coors Field. All about, It's about science and they do stuff. And so last year it was pretty neat. They were like, hey, let's let's calculate launch angle and see how far the ball you know gets hit. And so Vinny was just out there just hitting balls real easy, 
didn't hurt himself, which is great when you're, you know, you're about 50 years old, but just putting balls out into the left field stand. So, uh, uh, Vinny's, Vinny is great. Yeah. The number nine has, uh, ha- has a lot of history to it for the Rockies next three days coming up. Uh, we've got uh, Rockies playing against the Cleveland guardians, actually the Rockies first time in Cleveland since August of 2017, they're four and 10 in uh, 14 wow. games in Cleveland. So they haven't had uh, the best of luck Cleveland. You know, pretty pretty good baseball team uh, since '93, since since the Rockies have come about. Uh, Monday's game, 4:10, Austin Gomber versus Cal Quantrill. On Tuesday, also 4:10 p.m. start, Ryan Feltner versus Peyton Battenfield. Not a name I'm that familiar with, but he's got two starts in the bigs. He's he's interesting. Don't know who uh, Cleveland's going to have as their starter on Wednesday. Could be Zach Plezak. Could be Connor Pilkington against Noah Davis at 11:10. AM you are you are kind of west coast or mountain standard time uh, adjacent Sean how nice is it to be able to just like wake up and there's like baseball right away cuz i'm i'm originally from the east coast and you, know, you got to wait until 1 o'clock that's it and then you know you're watching baseball until midnight but it's it's nice to like kind of roll out of bed and you've got baseball and brunch and it's fantastic oh it's it's beautiful like i i love having baseball throughout the day my the job that i my my day job I uh, just kind of sit at a computer all day so I can kind of check up on scores and stuff, watch some games on the side. So getting getting to work in the morning and having baseball is fantastic. I'm from Texas, so it's only a one hour difference, but still that one hour makes a pretty big difference. And at the end of the night when it ends earlier and you got some time to actually decompress at the end of the night. Uh, maybe a couple hours now with uh, how quick these games have been yeah. going, which has been been really nice. And then, yeah, I guess uh, I guess the one benefit or maybe that's a detractor when some of these World Baseball Classic or international games are going on. Now, now they're they're in the middle of the night as opposed to, you know, maybe if you're on the East Coast and something starts at 4 a.m., you're like, I can make this work. I'd rather not. But if we're talking 2 a.m., 3 a.m., no one's getting up to start their day that way. I will say Mountain Time was probably the worst time zone for the, the East Asian pools for the WBC. It was the games would start at 3 a.m. So I had to choose whether I wanted to stay up until that time and then watch a three to four hour game into the morning when the sun comes up or go to bed at as early as I could, which didn't rarely ever happen, um, and then wake up at three o'clock to to watch those games. So it was just in the middle to where it was difficult on each side, but I did my best to try to watch as many of those as I could. Oh, that's amazing. That's amazing. Yeah, we'll have to uh, – next World Baseball Classic, I'm sure uh, all of us at the DNVR bar in the corner of Colfax, New York, and Denver, we'll have to have some watch parties. I mean, we hosted the World Cup party uh, for the, the Colorado Rapids. We'll see about 2026. Maybe we'll lay some groundwork today uh, for that event. And oh, I'm yeah. sure three years from now, if we don't have even better offers for all of our diehards, currently you get 15% off all your food and drink at the DNVR bar, 20% off all the gear at dnvrlocker.com, 20% off tailgates and takeovers. We've got one coming up on Saturday against the Diamondbacks, so that should be uh, another fun one, a $15 food voucher. You're going to get a free shirt from us at the DNVR Locker. Uh, bus going over to the stadium with all the brick brew you can drink uh, on the bus over there, so that's going to be uh, a lot of fun on Saturday. Again, diehards, you're getting 20% off on that. It's also NBA playoff time, so the bars is jumping with, with both Avs and, of course, the Nuggets, who unfortunately couldn't finish off the sweep. That being said, it's time for the Big Hoops action with DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NBA. The excitement is every single game, and it's yours with the touch of a button. New customers, you can place a $5 pregame money line bet, and when you win, you get $150 in bonus bets instantly. You don't have to wait (laughs) one second. It is instant. You can also score with the no-sweat same-game parlays every day during the NBA playoffs. Uh, just open up the app, opt in, and place the same game parlay on any NBA game. And guess what? If it doesn't hit, doesn't win for you, don't worry. You'll still get a bonus bet back up to $10. So download the app now and sign up with code DNVR. New customers can place that $5 pregame money line bet and score $150 in bonus bets if your team wins. Only at DraftKings Sportsbook and only with code DNVR. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. In Massachusetts, call 800-327-5050 or visit gamblinghelplinema.org. In New York, call 877-8-HOPE-NY or text HOPE-NY. In Kansas, call 1-800-522-4700 on behalf of Boot Hill Casino and Resort in Kansas. 21 or older in most eligible states, but age varies by jurisdiction. 
Eligibility restriction apply. See DraftKings.com slash sportsbook for details and state-specific responsible gambling resources. My DraftKings Sportsbook pick of the week is going to be on tonight's Guardians-Rockies game. First run. We're not going to have a nerfy. No, we're we're going to be having multiple runs scored in the first inning uh, <laughs> with these two guys on the hill. Probably more so for uh, the Guardians scoring against Austin Gomber. But it is now a, a second series for the Rockies after being at home. So I think they're going to settle into a, a slightly better groove. Start hitting on the road uh, just a little bit there, and we could see some some first inning runs and the Rockies jumping on. Cal Quantrill. So take the over mm-hmm. on one and a half. So not just one run. I think there's going to be two or more runs. That's going to be plus 230. It's my DraftKings Sportsbook pick of the week. All right, Sean, got to know, where where did the impetus, impetus where, where was the genesis of kind of diving into the World Baseball Classic and saying, you know what, uh, this is kind of underrepresented because for as much as it seemed like World Baseball Classic was everywhere, I still felt like there was much more of opportunity for MLB to jump on things. I think if you even went to MLB.com, there wasn't like a quick tab to even click over and see some of that. But you jumped on it immediately and said, as as much coverage as WBC is getting, there's room for even more. And you found that and you found an audience and then some. Where, what was that genesis for uh, for this undertaking? Yeah. And the funny thing about that is I think that compared to previous WBCs, there was a lot more coverage from MLB, from a lot of the big media companies and and even teams posting on their own socials. I will say, though, with the caveat of that didn't really start until maybe a month before the WBC started, Um, which for better or worse, obviously, like the the priority for a lot of these um, companies is is MLB. Major League Baseball, like that's what we cover. That's what we love. That's what we've known for 100 years. Um, However, I last year, last summer, when MLB officially announced, okay, no more delays. We're having the WBC in 2023. Uh, It's time to to pick it back up again because it was delayed a couple years after 2020. Um, I was like, all right, sweet. This is great. I loved it in 2017. This was a blast to watch. Let's see what the teams look like. Let's see what like the the rosters are going to shape up to be. And back in June 2022, there was absolutely nothing anywhere. There was like a little bit of hype for maybe two to three days. And then after once they announced it, after that, there was nothing. So I kind of took it upon myself just to do some independent research, look at who was eligible for what countries, uh, who could be playing, who's maybe hinted at what players and coaches have hinted at the fact that they want to participate. And I started making some uh, graphics, like graphic design, dream team graphics of what, if everybody from all the countries had decided to participate, what those teams could look like, just so that we could get kind of a visual of what we're expecting in 2023. Um, So didn't really expect anything to come of that. It was more of just like a self project. Uh, I mean, I went to school for like sports management and, and business. So I knew I wanted to do something in the sports world, but this is more like a side hobby. But there was a a big interest in those because no one was covering the WBC, especially other countries uh, like teams, because like maybe MLB had posted a couple of things about, oh, this guy committed to Team USA or this this guy might be playing for the USA. But they didn't really post anything else for the other 19 countries. So I wanted to have sort of like a uh, a place that we could see the updates and the teams and the news for all 20 countries, um, because there was, I, I noticed there was a need for that. So yeah, from there, I just started posting daily updates, daily news, daily content to, to the point to where like I would have coaches and players and like personnel on the federations of these different countries reach out to me and start giving me these updates because no one else was posting them. Um, so it was, it, it's been a wild ride the last couple months, but it's been a blast. And I think it just goes to show how much people love this tournament around the world and the potential of it in the future. Yeah, I, I, you have to think that the, you know, the buy-in from from Mike Trout, right from the get-go, at least again from the U.S. standpoint, because again, you know, MLB is where all the best best players are are playing, and yeah, there there are exceptions from other different countries, and, and some of the guys from Japan obviously uh, might be too young, and so they're not eligible to come over to MLB just yet. But if the best player in your mm-hmm. sport is going to play, and then Shohei Otani says he's going to play, and you say, well, all right, he's he's. 1A, 1B, you know, whatever order you want to put them in. Okay, now we all have to have send our best guys. And I think that that momentum, you know, really built for this year. Um, and I'm sure you saw that too with, with the engagement where you're you're slowly putting stuff out and then more and more responses. You come, my, I'm curious where uh, you're talking about figuring out eligibility 
for players. So recently <laughs> I saw a post like, oh, Anthony Volpe. Okay, uh, he was born in America. He's got Italian, uh, you know, bloodlines. You go, all right, he's an Italian guy, so okay, he can play Italy. And then you found out some information that like, oh, he actually would be eligible to play for Philippines. Uh, wh where where are you getting this information from? Are you literally going player by player and trying to read like every story about someone like going back to high school to look for like these notes and find out like, oh, Lars Nupar's mom is Japanese? All right, well, he's eligible to play there too. Where Are you really having to dig that deep for each and every player? I would, I'd be lying if I said it pretty much, if it wasn't pretty much that. Uh, all <laughs> last year, I was going roster by roster and like, oh, this guy, I can, I, he's talked about his family maybe coming from a different country or you just look at their name and you see... Uh, Grayson Rodriguez. Oh, I wonder where his family eventually came from. I'm still working on that one. I'm not sure yet. But um, I, there's just a lot of players that I was like, all right, well, they haven't talked about playing in the WBC, but it's possible that they might have dual or even triple eligibility, like you said, with Volpe. Volpe's mom is from the Philippines, but his dad is from Italian descent. And it all comes down to the eligibility rules for the WBC, which was, I think, probably a, one of the primary... Um, if, if you looked at any of my Twitter interactions last year and coming into this year, everybody was confused about the WBC rules and eligibility requirements because it, it is pretty confusing. I was even confused. So I really had to study up on them. Essentially, it boils down to the citizenship laws of that country. So if you are eligible for citizenship of that country, then you can play for the national team in the WBC. The part that gets tricky is that every country has completely different citizen citizenship laws and like different laws and requirements to get a passport. So whereas in Italy, if you can trace it back to a man in your family that was Italian, you can play for the country. Whereas like Japan, your parents have to be from Japan and you have to have a passport like their parents have to have a passport. So that's why Lars Newbar, whose mom is from Japan and has a Japanese passport, is eligible but like Vinny Pasquantino, who, which is like the most Italian name, he, he had never even been to Italy until earlier this year, but he was like, I'm playing. This is awesome. Oh, that's amazing. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I imagine you're probably contacting various countries, consulate, and I mean, technically you could be an ambassador for the United States. Like that, that was going to be one of my questions is have you also now, cause all right, you know, the WBC stuff has kind of dried up and so you know, uh, the, the GM of, of Venezuela might not be reaching out to you because, you know, that business is done. That being said, you're, you're still covering a lot of baseball over in, in Japan and Korea, Mexico. Uh, are you having to learn other languages to kind of break things down or are you just using the proper tools uh, still to like, you know, to, to break news and to get information on these guys uh, who, you know, aren't typically covered by English media? Yeah, it's a couple of things. I, I think one, Big help is the fact that Twitter has the Google Translate right in the tweet. So you can just click to translate it. You don't even have to take it to the browser and like actually search what that means. So a lot of the time you can get the gist of, of what a tweet means. And I've just over the last couple months figured out the, the accounts to follow for breaking news in different countries. And I mean, it, it pretty much boils down to Spanish and Japanese and Korean for the most part. Um, and then there's CPBL, um, the Taiwanese League and like Brazil has a decent following that's Portuguese. So I, for the most part, it's Japanese, Korean, and Spanish. I'd love to learn the languages. It's, it's pretty hard. <laughs> I've been trying, but for now, I've been relying on a lot of, and this is probably the coolest part for me of all of this coverage that I've done. I've had people reach out to me and offer just, hey, if you ever need any help translating or interpreting or putting captions on your videos in different languages um, or just like finding articles, please let me know because I'm always happy to help. And it's just created this, like the WBC's created this community that I don't think the baseball world has ever seen to where Japanese fans are often talking with like Cuban fans and like Canadian fans are, are like interacting on Twitter with like Taiwanese fans. It's, it's a really cool place that I don't think baseball has really ever been able to fully tap into that the WBC offers. Yeah, I hadn't thought of that. I mean, obviously, we, we think of baseball in the American perspective, and I think that's why one reason in, in the U.S. There are some people who have those takes of like, ah, these games are meaningless. And it's like, okay, I get why you would you would say that, but you're, you're completely missing it out. But to link someone from Canada and Cuba and say, 
okay, well, baseball is, you know, might be very popular in our country, but we don't have the same resources. What are you guys doing to kind of get by or, or what, what are the, what does the local scene look like on that? That's like fascinating um, to think yeah. about, you know, where, where that could go going back to the, uh, you know, mothers, grandfathers, grandmothers, all that stuff. Uh, I don't know if you have a Patreon or anything, but I imagine at some point somebody needs to hook you up with an Ancestry.com subscription, and you can really go ahead and dig in there in in, in a major way. That being said, you've got that avenue, and, and you've got to learn how to speak Japanese. you got to know the kanji. you got to know all that stuff so you can make the big 2026 WBC Team Japan Samurai Japan documentary, Sean. Come on. Oh, right oh there I got you. to. <laughs> I have to find a way to make it to Tokyo in 2026 too. It would just be the icing on the cake. Just I don't know if you got to watch any of those games, but man, Japanese baseball is wild. So I, yeah, I would love to learn some Japanese. I will say for my specific uh, situation, my wife and all of her family are Brazilian. So priority one is Portuguese right now. Uh, but after that, it's pretty similar to Spanish. I need to learn Spanish. I mean, we have all the Latin American countries that speak Spanish, but J Japanese is definitely up there as well. Oh, that's that's fantastic. I think there might be some Brazilian-born players on the American Raptors rugby team. They're uh, a local uh, rugby team that we've got right here in, in Denver. They play at Infinity Park. It's it's amazing. It's Rugby Town USA's newest rugby team. It's it's players who've been athletes and top athletes at, at all kinds of sports uh, that, that, that you've watched and loved, baseball, basketball, football, uh, Greco-Roman wrestling, you name it. But now they're learning how to play rugby, and you can actually learn along with them. Uh, with the DNVR Rugby Podcast hosted by Colton Strickler. That's every week. He's got Rugby 101s uh, that you can check out. He's talking with coaches and stuff. You can actually go over to AmericanRaptors.com to get tickets or stream some of their games. Uh, it's really fantastic. It's AmericanRaptors.com. Check out their their upcoming season in Infinity Park. Again, another great spot. If you're, if you're not a fan of going and supporting the Colorado Rockies baseball team, Go down to Infinity Park. That is uh, that is a, a rugby cathedral. I'll, I'll kind of put it at that. Crack open a can uh, or a bottle of Avalanche Ale. Breck Brew, of course. If you're not sure where to get it, uh, if it's not at your local King Supers, which it probably is, but if just in case it's not, go to breckbrew.com. Check out their Breck Beer Locator. It's amazing. It's a Colorado company that we love partnering with. It's made with 100% renewable energy. And uh, the Avalanche Ale, I mean, it's that time. It's the Avs. They're doing it. They're going to take down the Kraken celebrate with an avalanche ale it's it's totally fitting and if you need some food to go along with that well of course illegal pete's is the spot for you it's burritos beer buddies but you know what it's also graduation season or you know it might just be going outside and, and entertaining for some neighbors and if you don't have a grill or you don't want to do all that work little legal pete's do all that work for you they'll go ahead and cater your party or your family event whatever it may be uh, they got great ingredients, customizable options, it's the perfect way to treat a graduate or the, the loved ones uh, that are around you, no matter what it is. So don't worry about pulling an all-nighter making food because Illegal Pete's can do it for you. Illegal Pete's, again, your go-to spot for burritos, beer, and buddies. Sean, you did get a chance to uh, to cover the WBC Live. Were you in Phoenix and Miami or just Miami? Yeah, so for the pool stage, I had a chance to go to Phoenix uh, for a couple games. Um, uh, as I mentioned previously, I do have a day job, so unfortunately, I wasn't able to go for all the games. But I made like I, I needed to go to the U.S. Mexico game. Like that was my one requirement for Pool C in Phoenix. Got to go to that one, and then for the semifinals and the final. That's when, in that picture up there, that's what you see those. That's in Miami for the, uh, the I believe it was USA, Cuba, and Mexico, Japan, and then obviously USA, Japan. Yeah, that's that's awesome. We, we were trying on get, getting you on during that time, but again... Uh, you were busy. You you had that stuff going on, which was which was fantastic. Yeah, I love I love the the photograph, and there's also video too uh, for anyone uh, that isn't already following you at Sean underscore Spradling on Twitter. But that video of you know the World Baseball Classic ending, and you you sitting on the WBC logo, just like you don't you're not gonna make me go home, are you? Like you, you didn't have that look on your face either. It was also just like, this is amazing. I'm not going home by the way, but also on top of that, I'm still just feeling amazing. Like it hadn't hit you yet that it was over because there was just so much like, again, it, it, it can't be said enough that the matchup everyone wanted to see was Mike Trout and Shohei Otani. And the fact that we not only got that and we not only got that in the finals, but we got that 
to end it all was just like you wouldn't believe it if you read it in a story you'd go cool you're a great writer and all but it's just not realistic and we got that that was the reality of it all it was amazing it it was i mean i feel like we've talked about this over and over but it we can't talk about it enough like that last at bat we has been one we we've wanted to script that at bat since last summer when they said they were going to have the wbc like people have literally been talking about it since then ever since otani and trout both said they were going to play it i i was in the press conference after the mexico no after the us and uh and japan game and one of the players for japan was uh <laughs> he was talking about how it was so it, it seemed so fake and surreal that he thought it was manga so like comic books in Japan, it was it was so funny because they had to like translate it to English and everybody laughed once they translated it. It was just like even the players were watching sitting there in the dugouts like this isn't happening. Like the best player in the in baseball in the world against the other best player in baseball going up against each other teammates. And I, I truly think that we can talk about this as well. I think the future of baseball is international and the center of that is the WBC. And so years and years down the road, I think that the WBC is going to be significantly larger than it is now. And we're going to look back and realize, oh, this was one of the very first term tournaments that we had. And that is one of the biggest at-bats ever in WBC history. And the fact that we got to watch that, it went to two strikes, two outs in the bottom of the ninth in, on the biggest stage was beautiful. I think that that's a great point too, because, you know, what what are the big WBC moments? At least for Team USA, because again, look, that's that's just kind of how we think a little bit, or at least how I think. Adam Jones, hey, great catch. But that's that's like that's just a, that's just a moment. That's that's whatever. But to your point, around the world, that Otani Trout, you know, just it, it makes things just go to another level. And even on top of that, with him going out and running out to the bullpen, so you're like you're building this anticipation oh. in a unique way. Unlike anything else, uh, it's it's amazing. What what um, changes do you do you think might be coming in in twenty twenty six or or what are some better ways to to have the continue continue the mo the momentum? Like again, it's going to have especially only being three years away. It's still a very long time. Don't get don't get don't get me wrong. It's still a very long time. <laughs> but um, you know, you you, you got to reset things a little bit. So, is there anything that? You know, you, you think uh, MLB and, and the WBC has learned to to try to improve upon and, and, and continue this momentum. Yeah, I think there's a couple of things that are pretty clear uh, that MLB did really well. And then maybe some things that they can work on uh, moving forward in the WBC. This is only the fifth edition of the WBC ever. I mean, it started in 2006, 2006, 2009, 13 and 17. So it's still a very, very young tournament for a World Cup size tournament. Um, and so I think there's a lot of adjustments that can be made. That being said, I think it, it, it was very successful. It was everything that we wanted it to be. I think the big thing is just starting the hype and the publicity earlier. Like I was following it last summer when they officially announced that they were having the WBC in 2023. And I had a pretty large following of people that wanted to learn about the players and the teams and the, the history of the teams in the WBC, even last September in October. Um, and so I think that that's very easy to capitalize on and that will only grow the hype even more. Um, so hopefully that happens next time around. Maybe they'll actually hire me or pay me something to, to do that for them. I would love to, <laughs> but other than that, I think the big thing would be, um, figuring out the pools and the host cities. I think there's a, right now there's a decision that needs to be made moving forward and they should. I would love for them, MLB and WBC, to be more public and publicize it um, because half of the fans want the pools and the, the hosts to be around the world. And the other half of the fans want them all to be in the same city. And I think there's pros and cons for each of them. If you look at the World Cup, it's all in one city or at least all in one country so that you can truly randomize all of the pools um, and you don't have Dominican Republic and Venezuela and Puerto Rico all in the same pool together. Um, you can actually have Japan play against those teams in the pool stage. The other side, the other camp is, well, we want to like show off the baseball cultures and environments in these different countries. Like 
A lot of American fans learned about Taiwanese baseball for the first time because of this WBC. So I think there's pros and cons to each. I think that there just needs to be a decision that is made because they've talked about both of those. It seems like Rob Manfred wants to move towards still having it in the different countries um, and maybe even expanding to other countries. Um, But I think that clarifying that and figuring out which direction they want to go will be big. Yeah, the logistics of maybe having it in one place or even even removing the the, the same host countries right like you get it you know in, in in the far east with with japan and um you know taiwan hosting and 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 what or south korea so like you, you get that in america um yeah it, it would be interesting for for them to get to a spot where it is more like a world cup in that way where everyone goes to one location or or maybe again you you kind of have those early pool play in different locations um, I think yeah. you'd almost, it, it seems outside the box to say, well, U.S. wouldn't host with all the stadiums and the spring training facilities and most of the players already being there. But if you opened it up and said, well, we might be able to make this work in, in Monterey or Mexico City, you know, it's not too bad of a travel to have something like that. I, I really like, and again, uh, this might not be great for every single World Baseball Classic, but I like that now with there being 20 teams, the team that is in fifth place now has to qualify. So now yes. if you look at someone like Columbia, I think Columbia was probably one of the best teams that didn't qualify. And you say, oh, now uh, those qualifiers, now people might be paying attention to that maybe a little bit more. So now the qualifiers, instead of being you know countries that you don't maybe associate with baseball, like Pakistan or, or France, you know wh- whatever, um, now there's more focus on that. And I think that, that could be a way to continue to have it grow or just have players even commit a little bit earlier than just a year out. I mean, again, yeah. we, we saw how the rosters ended up getting shuffled anyway. So, you know, it's it's not the end of the world if maybe half the guys who commit two years early end up pulling out. Uh, but at least, again, it builds some of that momentum and reminding like, wow, yeah, Team USA could be really good with all of these guys. And even if they have to swap a couple of them out, that that's fine as well. Yeah, Patrick, I completely agree with all of that. Like, especially, I mean... I think that having, I, I guess, like covering and making, uh, like publicizing the the qualifiers more would be huge because those were some of the, my favorite games that I watched last year. Watching the Czech Republic qualify for the WBC for the first time ever against Spain, who was like the uh, huge favorites in those qualifiers to make it to the WBC was, was so much fun. Um, same with like Nicaragua and Great Britain. They qualified for the first time. There were just some really big like baseball stories and history that we got to see last September that not really many people knew about because just there wasn't much talk about it or buzz. Of course, it's September. So it's like nearing the end of the of the MLB season. Um, but there are still such fun games to, to watch. So if we can actually make those I guess more public and more accessible the next go around, which is only, I mean, it's 2024, no, 2025. So, I mean, it's not too far away. It's only two years away. Um, and then the the second part, um, I, I, what, what was the second point that you made about after that? Um, you, did you have qualifiers and, um, and having pitchers, you know, commit committing early? Oh, committing early. Yes. Um, because thank you. Uh, Forgot that one. Um, yeah, so for the commitments, it's really interesting because each country does their commitments differently. U.S. is very specific. Um, we have Major League Baseball, which is where all of our best players are. Um, so we we have to get those commitments because not everybody wants to play for, first of all. Most players do, especially on the offensive side. Pitchers are a little bit, it's, it's just a much trickier situation. But in Japan, there aren't even any commitments. It's just everybody plays. Everybody wants to play. It's the manager that's like, these are the best players. I choose them, and these players are left off the roster. So it's it's literally like a World Cup roster to where the entire country just wants to play. Same with Korea. I mean, even Dominican Republic and Venezuela. Like you have all of those countries that like all of those players are signing up. It's just who is the best players to actually get on the team. USA is the only one right now who were with our pitchers were still, I guess, lagging behind or just getting more used to international play. So I think as we have more WBCs moving forward, we'll just get more comfortable with that and be fine with, I don't know, if, if every, everybody gets on board to play, I think that commitments earlier are going to um, help a lot with just like hyping up the tournament even earlier. 
Yeah, with, and with each passing World Baseball Classic, it will become, like in Japan, the default. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm playing for Team USA. Why wouldn't I? And, and, and you're going to get all those best players. Have you thought about, you know, how the WBC could, could get, you know, more pitchers on board in spring training or a different scenario, a different timeline, different things have been pitched. Like perhaps you take a two week break where uh, the all-star game would be. And, and, and that's when you hold that tournament. Maybe you have a, you have an all-star game full of everyone that doesn't represent their country, um, but have it then, or, or something maybe towards, you know, the, the end of the season, maybe before the playoffs start, or even, you know, after the world series, something like that. Have, have, is there a better solution um, or are we just maybe not ready for that? that better solution just right yet uh, in 2023? Yeah, that's, I mean, that has been the biggest question about figuring out how to get the pitchers to, the U.S. pitchers to participate and just when we need to have this tournament. And I think, honestly, the best answer to that right now is probably still spring training. The three options that have been thrown around um, and I see pros for all of these, honestly. Um, it's just I don't know if <laughs> I don't know if owners and teams or MLB clubs are going to be on board. The three options are what it is right now, right before the seed regular season, where arms are fresh. Um, but then the the hard part about that is that the pitchers have to ramp up a little bit earlier. I think that we've gotten to a point to where a lot of the pitchers are just ready for that and that they know how to prepare like the Padres were like you Darvish is a veteran he knows what he needs to do to get ready just a week or two early he's going to be fine and he's pitched well this season so far um and he I mean they trusted him and he did well and of course we can we can't fully gauge what the injuries are going to look like until the end of the season when we look back on the season but that's spring training. The other two options are, like you said, which I think would be a really fun, an extended all-star week where you have maybe like a two or a two and a half week all-star week where you do have the WBC during the summer. Um, I, I mean, I think that'd be a ton of fun because then you could have, everybody's already taking a break. So you have that time to do the tournament. Um, and then maybe you could even do like a world versus USA all-star game like you do in a couple other sports or like a home run derby with all of these world stars i don't know there's a lot of options there the, yeah that'd be fun right <laughs> yeah. the uh the hard part with that is that i don't know if owners would want to give up their top players in july when they're really starting to like that's when the, the tr trade deadline is and that's when they're really starting to push for the playoffs and then it'd be the same reason for like after the season a lot of players play in winter ball a ton of players are used to that but it's mostly hitters. Pitchers normally take a break during that time. So, I mean, I think about all the pitchers from the Astros that played in the WBC that went all the way into November. If they had to like pitch even longer than that into later November or December, I don't know if their uh, front office would be too happy with that. So I, I see pros to all of those. I think the consensus right now is still spring training is the best time. But I mean, I like the extended All-Star break idea. Yeah, that would be cool. Yeah, I, I guess if you were in the postseason or going, you know, in the World Series, you're kind of exempt or you're excluded from like participating uh, from that. Like like you mentioned, it does make me think too. With and again, maybe this is a coincidence. Maybe this is entirely unto Clayton Kershaw, who you know was originally selected for Team USA. And for anyone that doesn't know, and, and you know the details probably way better than I do, uh, but all these players who participate, um, they have to, there has to be insurance for them so that if a player gets injured, like Edwin Diaz and he's done for the year, well, the, the Mets get, you know, recoup those expenses. They, they, they lost a player, which is way worse, uh, than just, you know, finances. They probably would rather pay a tax, uh, especially the Mets. They would love to pay an extra $7 million to have that closer back. Um, <laughs> but you need to be insured. And so Clayton Kershaw didn't get insured. And so I'm wondering if, that that could be a, an, an indicator that again, maybe it's just him and his injury history, which I'm sure is part of it, but also that pitchers could be harder to insure. And so, at spring training or maybe even at any time, it could be harder to get the top pitchers on board because of again just the the nature of throwing a ball overhand and, and how uh, unnatural that is and how likely you are to get injured. And so, you know that that could be something that prevents us from really ever you know, getting the, the best pitchers to buy in for the WBC. Yeah, I I don't know what the answer to that is yet because it's just, I mean, it's so messy. Insurance in general is messy, but like when you come, when it comes to hundreds of millions of dollars 
at stake for these MLB clubs. You, you heard Clayton Kershaw talking about it after when he had to, I guess, quote unquote, decommit. He was like, they, I, I couldn't get coverage. MLB wouldn't cover it. I even tried to figure out if I could just get in insurance myself, like cover myself. And he, he just couldn't get it for himself. So there's, I don't know, there's just a lot that's messy with that, that I, I can I, I can't imagine that I don't know we saw for example Sandy Alcantara Cy Young winner he pitched in the WBC you got Christian Javier who threw no hit almost no pretty much a no hitter in the World Series last year he threw in the WBC so you got Shohei Otani best player in the world also pitched all the way to the end you got these top pitchers that are able to get insurance they get the okays from their team. So I, I don't think it's going to be a long-term issue. I just don't know what that issue that I guess the solution is now for guys like Kershaw who do have an injury history. Maybe it's just they're out of luck and sorry, too bad. Like you're just too much of a liability. But for a lot of the top pitchers like the Alcantara's and Javier's and Otani's, I think they should be fine moving forward to play in the WBC. And we've seen that they actually want to. So as long as their teams give them the okay, they just need to get that insurance. Before we kind of uh, briefly touch on the, the international baseball that's still going on outside of our, our borders here in the U.S. Internationally, let's talk about what's on deck next for MLB. We've got the London Series is back again this year, Cubs, Cardinals. Um, and, you know, in the last CBA, there there was something written in there about the potential for some games in, in Europe, and it seems like Paris is that spot. Have we gained any ground with having a game in Paris, or is there another kind of dark horse city in Europe that we could see? Uh, uh, not an exhibition game, but an actual regular season game. Yeah, I haven't heard much since they announced Paris, so my guess is that they're still planning on it being in Paris, which is the coolest thing ever. I mean, do we all get to watch games in like these countries that we're not used to watching baseball? It's going to be a blast. Um, I I haven't heard anything since then. I could see. Maybe in the future, there being games in the Netherlands because they really like baseball. Um, Italy, maybe even they have a good baseball league there as well. I just don't know what their baseball stadiums look like. It would probably have to be like uh, they do in London where they convert a soccer stadium. But um, yeah, my guess is Paris. Other than that, it's the London series and Mexico series, which is like, I think in a week or so. It's really it's coming up soon this weekend, I think. Yeah, I, I would hope that MLB is really using the success of this last WBC to really try to to grow the game and, and be maybe more aggressive than they've they've been in the past, not just with these series, but also just 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 creating better avenues. Like you said, Italy, does it have the stadiums? Well, you know, it continues to qualify and, and does well. I think it's pretty much gotten out of pool play just about every WBC. Like that's really impressive. And so what is MLB doing to you know kind of help help fund that league or um, to get more money that way. I know uh, talking yeah. with with someone who's close to the tournament, you know, with with Great Britain, like their success in qualifying for the next tournament. While I don't know that it necessarily uh, the WBC or MLB that if any money is 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 changing hands to to support them, kind of similar to uh, you know the uh, how soccer is is over in Europe, where all right, if you get mm -hmm. promoted, but then you go back down to a lower league, you still get some balloon payments, and so you still benefit. But the, the benefits in Great Britain is the fact that now that they are have qualified for this next tournament, uh, the government itself can say, hey, this is kind of a little bit more legitimate. So now we can ourselves as a country, you know, fund it and support it within the country. Um, what do you think some of the next steps that MLB has to yeah. do to kind of, you know, continue with uh, the success internationally or um, just just moving the game? Do, do you think there's a chance for, you know, Mexico City or Monterey to have an expansion team? Probably not 32. But 34, like, like what, what are some of the next steps or some of the things uh, maybe you're bringing to the table that if Rob Manfred has given Sean Spradling a call, what would you tell him, right? <laughs> I, uh, yeah, I, I mean, I would love to see an expansion team in Mexico. We have a team in Canada. I mean, it's possible to do it in another country and they're just south of the border, especially like Monterey, which is not too far from Texas. Like it's, it's not that far of a plane ride. Mexico City would be really interesting because it's a little bit farther but also it's like it's the elevation's higher than cores like the balls would fly there so it would be that'd be a lot of fun to watch but yeah i think 
I'm not going to pretend to know the ins and outs of the funding uh, for the federations and how MLB supports the the federations. What I do know is that each team that qualifies for the WBC is given a certain amount of money. Once you make it on in the next round, you're giving even more. I think for the if you qualify for the WBC, it's three hundred thousand dollars. Which for someone like Great Britain or the Czech Republic, that's a ton because they don't they don't have hardly anything to they they raise all of their money independently. They don't have these big leagues to pour into them or the government. So um, that's huge. The fact that Great Britain doesn't have to requalify next time around, um, and so you can really capitalize that on that. And hopefully, Manfred and MLB continue to invest in that there's there's clearly an emphasis moving forward on making baseball more international mlb both mlb and just like the wbc just baseball globally um in these other leagues so hopefully with these mexico series and the london series in paris we can start seeing more popularity and hopefully more funding put into those domestic leagues so that they can um, actually start growing some homegrown players you see someone like Max Kepler, who came from Germany, um, he was developed in Germany. So it's possible to see players like that are developed in different countries and still come over to MLB. So I think that if you have the funds um, of, for, for these certain countries, I think that goes a long way, both in the WBC and um, for just developing them for MLB. My mind is starting to, to, to spin out and think of all these things of Great Britain opening up a baseball academy and in the off season, who better than to come and, and maybe cut the ribbon, but a Jazz Chisholm. And you go, okay, here, oh. now we're starting to, right? We're starting to see it all come together and mesh and take advantage of that. And and now Jazz is like, you know, yeah, I was excited before, but now I'm really sick. Now there's like people, there's hands that I'm shaking. There's babies I'm kissing. Like yeah. uh, it's a legitimate thing that can, can be really exciting. So yeah, 2026 World Baseball Classic is great. Uh, for anyone that is maybe not paying attention to the KBO, NPB, uh, or even LMB or CPBL. These aren't just letters, folks. These are leagues going on around the world. And I know uh, those leagues don't get as much attention now that the pandemic is over. It was a, it was a great moment in time when you know everyone was following you know what's going on in Japan and South Korea. But uh, what are what are some of the best stories that are out there, or your favorite stories for people to you know tune into a, a Nippon Ham Fighters game or or something like that? What should they be? What are they going to see maybe if they uh, if they're following you on on Twitter? Yeah, no, that's that's a great question because I think that now that the WBC is over, my whole thing is like I want to grow baseball around the world and kind of connect the baseball world. The WBC was like the the main, the pinnacle of that, but there's still so much baseball year round every year. So like you said, Korea, Japan, Taiwan, you got all of these leagues that are very, very solid that, I mean, you got the top of the players in NPB coming over here and killing it over here. Like they're doing great. So clearly there's talent in other places of the world. I think the first thing that you need to expect is waking up at 3 a.m. and learning how to do some uh, adjusting of your sleep schedule. But (laughs) if you can get over that and watch a couple games, it is some of my favorite baseball that I've been able to see. Um, Top headlines, just briefly, we can, like a couple of the top players from Japan, since Japan is the consensus second best league in the world, they're just behind MLB. Of course, MLB is the best, but they're they're better than AAA, like clearly better than AAA. And so we got a lot of their top players come over to MLB, but not all of them. A lot of their players just stay because they want to be home and they get paid plenty to stay in Japan and, and succeed and do really well. The top players that you're going to want to know, Yoshinobu Yamamoto, he's going to probably be the top free agent international free agent next year um he's going to be one of the best pitchers on the market coming into usa because his team is finally posting him after this npv season he is the consensus best pitcher in japan has been for like three four years he's won back-to-back mvps cy young's pitching triple crowns like he's doing a lot of stuff that has never been seen on the mound in japan so he'll be coming over here i think he's only 24 right now he'll be coming over to mlb next year following this season that being said He's probably not in a couple years going to be considered the best pitcher in Japan because there's a younger pitcher who also was on Team Japan. Both of these guys were um, for the WBC. Roki Sasaki, who is 21 years old, throwing 102 miles per hour, the nastiest pitcher maybe in the world at 21 years old at this point. Like he is, he hasn't allowed a run in three straight starts in Japan yet. His 
strikeouts per nine are like 15 plus right now. It is absurd. He had like 20, like 30 swinging strikes of this last start. It was ridiculous. So last year he made some headlines because he almost threw two straight perfect games. It was one ending short because his coach pulled him. <laughs> he could have, he could have gone two straight perfect games. So he's going to come over to MLB. At least he says he wants to. We're going to have to wait a good five years or so though, uh, because he's still so young and because of the posting um, system, it, it, it takes a while for the players to actually be eligible to be posted unless you're like Otani and you take a hundred million dollar pay cut to come over here to play. It's very rare though. Like you, it, it's a lot of money to miss out on for a few years. So those are the top pitchers in Japan. Uh, yeah. You know, it's, and I think we it, saw, it's, well, it's, it's really Saki exciting. And Yamamoto going against each other. So like that was, that was like a big matchup. So yeah, you, you've got all that covered. You're still, you know, uh, again, keeping tabs on all the, the U S players. Hey, there, where, where can they play in the next world baseball classic? So, um, it's, it's still incredibly relevant to everything going on. Sean, yeah. um, following you, uh, at Sean underscore Spradling, uh, on Twitter, anywhere else, uh, baseball's boring podcast as well, right? Yep. Uh, so my podcast is WBC central on the baseball isn't boring podcast network. Um, you can, if you look up baseball, isn't boring, you'll find it on all podcast streaming platforms. Um, my Twitter is mostly where I do most of, most of my coverage, Sean underscore Spradling. I have TikTok as well. It's basically all my tweets, but in video form. So, um, that's Sean Spradling, just at Sean Spradling. Um, I have an Instagram, don't really post much baseball on there. Um, but everything's in my link tree. If you go to my Twitter as well, so you can follow everything there. Awesome. We are at DNVR underscore Rockies at Patrick D. Lyons is where I'm at at Twitter. And uh, there's a saying when it comes to baseball and momentum and podcast, Sean, it's that you're only as good as your next show. So we will talk to you tomorrow at 1 p.m. on the DNVR Sports Channel here on YouTube.